All right, one more time. Aloha. Aloha. All right, let's go. I'm Lieutenant, I'm Lieutenant Commander Ralph Laffey from N6 Directorate at Commander U.S. Pacific Fleet. It's my pleasure to be your MC for this final event of FCA Asia Pacific TechNet. As a courtesy to our guest speaker and to our fellow professionals, we request that you silence your communication devices. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please rise for the invocation from Commander Jim Pugh, and please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Let us pray. Holy God, in all your many blessings, the gift of fellowship and partnership are among your most valuable. Lord, we are grateful for the opportunity to come together this week to re-strengthen lasting bonds and partnerships, as well as build new relationships that will continue and ensure interoperability and regional security. Lord, we pray that the progress that has been made this week carry on throughout the coming weeks and months, and that we all continue to work together in common cause and purpose. Finally, Lord, bless this meal. Bless our speaker and the fellowship that we share this afternoon. We ask you, God, to continue to bless us and our leaders as we go about the business of defending what we hold dear. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Thank you. Please note that the questions for our speaker today will be text to the email address provided on the screen. Patrons and sponsors, joining us this afternoon are Jimmy Atkins of VP Sales of Hitachi Federal, Mike Leff, VP or VP of Defense, ATT Public Sector, and Otto Hornig, CEO of Trace Systems. Thank you for your support. We're also joined today by tomorrow's leaders and their cadre who are now part of a junior and senior ROTC program from across this great state of Hawaii. Would you please stand? University of Hawaii, Army and Air Force, ROTC. Go Warriors. High school in attendance, Kailua High School, the Surf Riders. Kaiser High School, the Cougars. <laughs> Milani High School, the Trojans. <laughs> Mauna Loa, La, La Menehune. Kela Kehe High School, the Wave Riders. Wave Riders. All right. And Waimea, Waimea High School, Na Menehune. A big aloha to neighbor island schools from, high, from Kailua Kona on the Big Island and Waimea High School from Kauai, who are also in attendance with the day. So thank you for making that trip. Additionally, mahalo for your dedication to serve and hope this will continue the proud Hawaii tradition of great military leaders from Hawaii, such as current U.S. Senator Tammy Duckworth and Medal of Honor recipient, the late Daniel Noe. Additionally, your ROTC units are following the historic footsteps of the 442nd Regiment Combat Team and the 100th Infantry Battalion. Go for broke, the Purple Heart Battalion, the most decorated unit for its size and length of service in the entire history of the U.S. military. Thank you. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, we will now break so you may enjoy your meal. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start the uh, main event of today's program.
How was that meal? That meal was outstanding. That was an outstanding meal. And the service was outstanding too, so thank you. Yeah. I'm gonna try to get seconds uh, when they roll out here, so. Ladies and gentlemen, this afternoon's speaker is Rear Admiral Kenneth Whitesell, Deputy Commander, U.S. Pacific Fleet. We all know the saying, you say the best for last, and today is no exception. Unfortunately, I'm not talking about the MC, but today's guest keynote speaker. Today's keynote speaker represents the best in personal military and proven leadership. Rear Admiral Whitesell is a native of Stewart's Draft, Virginia, home of the Stewart's Draft Diamondbacks of the Rockingham County Baseball League. He's a graduate of Old Dominion University, the Joint Forces Staff College, Naval War College, with a Master of Arts degree in National Security and Strategic Studies, a licensed scholar and a warrior. As a career Navy aviator, he has served in numerous leadership positions, in Desert Shield, Southern Watch, Deliberate Guard, Allied Force, Iraqi Freedom, and Inherent Resolve. Most recently, he led the George H.W. Bush Care Strike Group as it resumed strike missions in support of Operation Inherent Resolve from the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. During that time, the George Bush Carrier Air Wing 8 flew over 1,900 combat sorties, a record not matched since Desert Storm. It is truly an honor and privilege to introduce this afternoon's speaker, Rear Admiral Kenneth Whitesell, Deputy Commander, U.S. Pacific Fleet. So I think my mom would appreciate uh, that introduction, and the longer it goes just means the older, uh, uh, the older I am. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. I need to have my wife in the audience when uh, people say that. Uh, I appreciate that. I know you guys are on, uh, on your third and final day, and the introduction said uh, save the best to last, but I also know the last is the last. So uh, I'll try to, get, uh, try to get, you, get across the points that we have uh, as a force here in the Pacific Fleet and where we're, uh, and where we're going, hopefully to complement the speeches that we've had before. I want to thank the folks here at, uh, at the Hilton Hawaiian Village for hosting this again uh, uh, again this year. It's absolutely phenomenal to come to the, to the Hilton. They do a phenomenal job, and I can tell by the meal, uh, if anybody nods off during the speech, then uh, it won't be bad. Admiral Mackey. Hey, thanks for the, uh, the invite, Admiral Aquilino. I know he owes you one since Dash 2 had to come uh, for that. Uh, Corey Lindo, uh, Chairman of the Board. Where's Corey? Hey, sir, uh, right across the seat from me, Linda Newton. Linda, thank you uh, again for the Hawaii Education Foundation. General Shea telling stories between uh, Admiral Mackey and yourselves. Uh, it's like two JOs going at it there, so I had a lot of fun during the uh, lunch. And uh, Cynthia helped me on the way in. Where's Cynthia Pacheco? Uh, yep, she made me feel good on the, uh, on the way in. And uh, as she explained, it's a tireless effort that she's done over many years to put this three-day event together. So I think a round of applause for those as well as for Cynthia. <laughs> I'll leave the glasses off for now. Uh, before I get too far in today's speech, I want to, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out my gratitude for FCA's work to include and recognize our future leaders uh, uh, in events like this. Uh, it was pretty neat to see the uh, ROTC units being recognized and the JROTC units uh, also. I'd like to thank you for your interest and commitment uh, as the ROTC dudes here, and, uh, and can everyone give them a round of applause? Only a few people in the audience know the, uh, the Navy at University of Hawaii is going to stand up here, uh, not this coming uh, academic year, but the year after that. And Biscuit Nesbitt, uh, Super Hornet uh, aviator, is going to come in as the, ROTC, the initial ROTC uh, coordinator for that. And we are going to have a Navy presence at, uh, at the University of Hawaii. So this is a big deal for us, and we're really looking forward to that. Okay. Okay, for the last uh, few days, uh, the participants here have talked uh, a lot about what has changed. I'd like to start my remarks today by talking about what has not changed. For starters, the size of the Pacific AOR, uh, it still remains massive, and a vast majority of it is still water. I know we talk about that in today's environment. Uh, 
Indo-PACOM's name change highlighted the strategic importance of our expanding partners and the friends who share the coastal region with the Indian Ocean. This includes a growing relationship with India that I've talked to a couple folks about. And it takes a capable U.S. Navy to cover the 100 million square miles of sea and airspace. For all the talk of a shrinking world and information sharing and cyber have shrunk our world in many ways, we must still, still deal with the tyranny of distance that is maritime Pacific theater. Uh, the last time our Navy was challenged in a blue water high-end fight was World War II. Most of us here understand just how precarious the opening months of the war were for our nation and Navy, especially in the months that followed the attack right after here in Pearl Harbor. The lessons we learned then supports why the preponderance of Navy force structure is in this area of responsibility. Speaking of World War II, by show of hands, how many of you guys have seen the movie Midway? Pretty cool, uh, number one on the opening weekend, uh, go Navy. Uh, according to the Navy Historical Society, it's probably the best representation historically of what, was, uh, of what turned the tide in the Pacific uh, around that time. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to, uh, to go. It's a great history lesson for our citizens, many of whom don't understand what our nation and the world went through 75 years ago. It's also a stark reminder to those of us in uniform. I'm proud that we won that pivotal battle in June of 1942, but none of us want to see a sequel. In preparing for this speech, one of the scenes in the movie really caught my attention. Naval aviator Lieutenant Dick Best, fresh off a bombing run, finds himself trailed by multiple enemy fighter zeros. I'd shoot my watch, but it's only a $15 watch, and it's, it's cheap. I don't want to do that. His gunner takes out uh, a couple of zeros behind him, but he can't shake one of the Japanese zeros. Anyone remember who saw the movie, how he evades the enemy? Crickets. Well, he dives into the cloud. Even an old aviator like me knows the difference between that kind of cloud and the one so many of you have, there we go, finally they get the punchline. It's going to be that kind of audience? Okay. Have talked about here over the last few days. Today's Navy recruits, the Centennials, know this arena well. They spend an average of three hours and 30 minutes a day using electronic media. They make decisions on the value of information in less than eight seconds. They seek to visually learn through myriad applications on electronic devices at their fingertips. Books, PowerPoint, and even TV is a thing of the past unless Netflix is streaming live on their Apple or Android. These digital natives are our future across the world in every country. Today's information uh, technology cloud offers so much more defensive and offensive opportunity to all of our joint forces. Just like Dick Best demonstrated, the sky is the limit. Of course, our adversaries know this too. So we must also mitigate the risks and eliminate vulnerabilities of these mushrooming capabilities. Traditionally, technology has provided the US military with a competitive advantage over our adversaries. For several decades, the United States enjoyed superiority in all domains. Clearly, these days have faded. Now we are contested by China across the entire spectrum, air, land, sea, space, and cyber. The national defense strategy highlights the People's Republic of China and Russia as our primary threats, both in this AOR, followed closely by North Korea, Iran, and violent extremists. Three of the five threats to our country are located in this AOR. There is no shortage of work. Former Defense Secretary James Mattis said, in this great power competition environment, that America has no preordained right to victory on the battlefield. That same victory or defeat comment could be made in the space and cyber domains. As China constructs their space Silk Road paralleling the malign Belt and Road military initiatives, we need to ensure the same visibility and same threats 
are shown the same light and displayed before the world to judge. Understanding what we face here earlier that what we understanding what we face here earlier this, earlier this month, the newly assigned chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Senator uh, Staff uh, General uh, Milley, said the U.S. focus on the Pacific is the number one regional priority. Militarily, China's use of cyber highlights a key challenge in the region. A few short days ago, the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission released its annual report warning of China's growing cyber capabilities. It says, quote, Chinese firms and research institutes are advancing use of AI that could undermine U.S. economic leadership and provide an asymmetrical advantage in warfare. It goes on to indicate, Chinese military strategists see AI as a breakout technology that could enable China to rapidly modernize its military, surpassing overall U.S. capabilities and developing tactics that specifically target U.S. vulnerabilities. In stark contrast to American values, the Communist Party of China is persistent and aggressive in their use of digital means to challenge an open, interoperable, and secure internet. This is a perfect example of the difference between our view of free and open and their view of closed and controlled. We've seen ample evidence of intellectual and propriety, uh, proprietary information theft. Especially disturbing is the Chinese Communist Party's ambivalence to getting caught. The rules-based order is turned on its head. It's only illegal if you're caught. Militarily, China looks to exploit our digital dependencies and vulnerabilities in cyberspace and actively working to gain advantages. Let me be frank, with the meteoric growth of cyberspace capabilities by other nations, including China and Russia, they have demonstrated a willingness to employ them in malign behavior towards other nations. NATO Secretary General Jen Stolenberg wrote a compelling piece this last August saying that a cyber threshold once tripped should be enough to trigger Article 5 for collective self-defense among allied countries. Crippling transportation infrastructure, electrical grids, causing economic failures, or becoming causal to innocent civilian deaths are considerations being debated. Confronting high-tech competitors requires a new kind of coordinated effort across all domains of warfare, land, sea, air, space, and cyber. Just how we do that, the AI and network technology, military protocols and organization required to execute seamless command and control is the challenge before us. With AI, will humans even fight again on the battlefield? What is the future of the battlefield? Power grids, transportation networks, the list is not only endless, it is growing. We must protect as well as exploit in cyber warfare. Trojan horses, sleepers, and even more insidious and ever increasingly automated information battle space presents a dilemma for us. To fight and win, our forces should be able to blind the adversary. In battle, the clear eye has the advantage, most likely a decisive advantage. Electromagnetic warfare and a low probability of detection and intercept will enable or hamper military success. At the Pacific Fleet, I am both encouraged and gratified by the work and innovation our team is offering in support of the U.S. Indo-Pacific joint warfighting approach. Those of us who are a certain age remember the importance of the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. When it comes to the dynamic 21st century cyber environment, you might say we've gone back to school. Our new three R's are resilient command and control, redundant command and control, and reconstitutable command and control. We must establish essential C2 during contingency operations in degraded or denied environments in order to defeat near-peer adversaries. The concepts of our N6 staff, and I know Bob Stevenson was on an earlier panel, and others are working should there be no surprise to anyone who attended the conference this week. That said, we are in a great power competition with other countries who have a knack for collecting and then copying 
or defeating good ideas. Our adversaries learn where the lines are, always testing, probing, and moving on. For today's remarks, I'll not be overly specific so as to make their job easier. Here are a few areas in which we have made progress and that offer real promise. The Joint All-Domain Command and Control Initiative, Adaptive Force Packaging, Combined Enterprise Regional Information Exchange System, Centrix, Cooperative Maritime Forces Pacific, CMFP, and Communities of Interest, COI. Concerning Joint All-Domain Command and Control, or JADC2, C2 across all of our military services, geographic combatant commanders and their service components. We face a sweeping set of challenges today. Reconciling hurdles that prevent connectivity, data sharing, user interaction across various protocol standards and applications can stack the deck against a vision of sensor to shooter nimbleness in joint warfighting. As an example, imagine a carrier-based E2 Advanced Hawkeye could route targeting information on a surface or air threat to a destroyer and could fire a missile beyond its own sensor range. This isn't exactly a brand new idea. Some of you may recall the 2015 deployment of the Theodore Roosevelt Strike Group, the first to combine Hawkeye with destroyers using upgraded Aegis combat systems armed with SM6s. It's one thing to have a Navy system to talk to one another. We must bridge the gaps and break through technical walls between the services. Wherever possible and practical, we must extend this to our allies and partners. The Air Force has concepts, multi-domain command and control. The Army referenced multi-domain battle and, uh, and their newly called multi-domain operations. These service-specific integrations are our battle right now to work to make the Joint Force more interoperable. It has our military's full attention today. The Joint Staff is now leading a cr uh, joint cross-functional team on joint all-domain C2. And last week, Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Mike Gilday and Air Force Chief of Staff General Dave Goldfein reportedly reached an informal agreement to develop the JAD C2 environment. While I'm encouraged by this top-down leadership, our staff here at PAC Fleet is aggressively moving forward. We are working act actively because we must be ready to fight and win the high-end blue water war tonight. Presently, our Navy supports JADC2 via the Navy Tactical Grid. It's one that gives our forces and others information sharing and operational awareness capabilities. We exercise and flex this system because those contributing to any joint fight bring an ever-evolving suite of information, data, and communication requirements. If the joint forces are spanning 100 million miles of sea and airspace in the Pacific theater, seamless network interoperability is vital to efficiently fighting and winning. One of the reasons to conduct a steady parade of exercises with our joint partners, allies, and other partners is so that we can refine and improve operations. They also help us first identify and ideally rectify or reconcile weapon systems and C2 incompatibilities across our diverse fighting force. Those lessons were learned in the interwar years before the start of World War II. We aggressively are honing our tactics, techniques, and procedures today the same way they did prior to World War II. In this dynamic cyber environment, we understood, understand the necessity to embrace a more flexible footing to enable our joint forces and partners. It is in that spirit that our staff has built into our Pacific Fleet Operations Center an adaptive force package, or AFP. It's an increasingly robust and reliable command and control capability that ensures we can deploy the means for C2 to any shore or ship location. It is literally a containerized set of functional capabilities, including C2, fires, intelligence, that we can dis dispatch to support ship or shore support in any exercise or any needed operation. The suite employs cloud computing to a host of multiple capable baselines, configuration management, cyber upkeep, scanning, user training, and shore-based support, even supporting various levels of information classification. 
The AFP also pairs the use of shore commercial cloud, and this bridging allows improved and timely effectiveness and efficiency. While JADC2 is critically important in winning a high-end fight, Admiral Davidson rightfully recognized that the U.S. Indo-PACOM effort ultimately hinges on seamless integration with our allies and partners. We need to improve collective cybersecurity during combined operations. Interoperability and releaseability with our allies and partners is essential. Our Pacific Fleet staff has focused its support in this regard to the Combined Enterprise Regional Information Exchange System. Centrix, the Cooperative Maritime Force Pacific, CMFP, and the communities of interest, the COI. Centrix, CMFP, and COIs promote coalition information sharing and support combined USN operations with partners and allies. Without re revealing too much detail, our bilateral enclaves with Chile, France, and India allow for uh, ad hoc network based on operational and exercise requirements. They adhere to foreign disclosure policies and present a smart balance of extending capability while mitigating vulnerabilities to information security. In short, if country X ends up supporting the U.S. in a fight, we can quickly and safely establish a dedicated suitcase network for data and information sharing. We're making progress, and I'm proud of the professionals on our fleet staff, but we've got a long road to hoe. Our information warfare team members are running at a sprinter's pace, but we know this is a marathon, and the path has many steep hills and blind curves ahead. Events like Techno, uh, TechNet uh, Indo-Pacific are crucial to inform and validate the road we're paving. I'd like to thank AFCEA and all the participants in this room and at the conference for their investment of time, attention, and expertise. On behalf of our uniform members, especially those deployed throughout the Pacific, preserving the peace, and positioned to fight and win if presence fails, thank you. But you know better than me, the real work is only just beginning. I challenge everyone in this room to lean into the change, the opportunity, and the risks that the 20th century connected environment offers our military and our nation's security. Remain vigilant and alert to emerging cybersecurity adversarial threats to our tactics, techniques, procedures, and systems. If you see something, say something. When and where, where and when you can, seek opportunities to improve the recruitment and retention of C4 ISR talent for our military services. The ROTC and the JROTC kids here today. Keeping pace with adversaries and the speed of innovation demands we have the best educated, trained, and brightest young people who want to make a difference to their nation and world. Build on a foundation of mutual support between the institutions who are fundamental to improve our cyber efforts. Collaboration and trust between DOD, industry, and academia are crucial if we are to seize the advantage. And finally, understand, explore, and innovate our nation's burgeoning reliance on cloud computing, the model in our digital modernization. That, the, that, is, that is extending our traditional borders of our national security. Artificial intelligence potential, data storage security, computational capacity, and the Internet of Things means the future has arrived. Thank you, and I look forward to the rest of today's program. And I think uh, I have to ask questions is what they give me a holler for. Okay. This is the part I'm most scared about. Well, thank you, sir got a few questions teed up. Uh, first up, can you briefly describe some of the coalition interoperability challenges that you face? Um, probably the initial, the initial thing that we saw through, uh, through some of our planning conferences to make sure that our tactics, techniques, and procedures are aligned uh, so that there's no surprises during, uh, uh, during an exercise. Again, if you, uh, if you were able to talk to some of our N6, our uh, department, including Bob Stevenson at the panel uh, prior to this, the amount of work that we do uh, prior to an exercise to maintain the command and control and the connectivity and the ability to set up enclaves for communications between uh, our ships uh, and the, uh, uh, the partners that we're operating with, we've, we've moved... Uh, I think we've moved into an arena where we've solved, uh, we've solved that problem. Uh, that, is the, that is most of the, of the difficulties that, uh, that we have. Uh, when it comes down to 
the high-end fighting. Uh, unlike the way the, the Chinese, when they operate uh, with other navies in their region, they bring an exercise in and it's done for their benefit. It's their exercise. For us, when we bring and we start to operate with a partner, we go in and it's open to, it's open to them. What do they want to accomplish from there? And then uh, that allows them to accomplish training uh, and, and maturation of their military on their, at their pace and the scale that they need it. At the same time, uh, there's stretch goals that we provide during all of the exercises that show the, these uh, partner militaries uh, what the realm of the possible is. And we also let them know where we're going towards the high-end warfare. Uh, eventually, uh, putting everyone together as a, uh, as a coordinated effort in the, uh, in the Western Pacific is going to be critical if, uh, if things go kinetic. Thanks, sir. Next question. Does PAC Fleet currently have enough assets to meet challenges? Where are you talking from? Okay, now I see where you're talking. I'm looking around to find out where, you know, did God, did God friend me on this? Okay, now, now I've got, okay, now that I see you and I don't have to, you know, my mind is completely fooled here. Okay, now can you repeat the question now that I got that? Absolutely. Does the PAC Fleet currently have enough assets to meet challenges? Yeah. Uh, I think you talked to... Uh, any of the joint services, uh, any of the components that would say that they could always use, uh, uh, they could always uh, use extra uh, forces. So it comes down to uh, an allocation and a prioritization scheme uh, that is critical to the, way, uh, to the way we participate in exercises with uh, partners or as we patrol to make sure that free and open Indo-Pacific and the maritime environment there. Uh, uh, We'd like to have more uh, in the CNO and Admiral Aquilino. We're just talking this uh, this week at uh, at Fleet Sync, but you've got to remember as while three of five adversaries are in this AOR, uh, the Russia shares itself with uh, with Africa, violent extremists in Iran, who is the fourth, uh, the third or fourth partner, depending on where you uh, uh, where your vantage point is, is uh, is making us do cheetah flips in the. Uh, in the Arabian Gulf also there. So uh, we have sufficient to do the missions that we have to do now. Uh, and there will be, a, if something were to kick off, the flow of forces to the AOR would, uh, uh, would be according to plans that we've developed. Thank you, we've got time for one more. And uh, could you talk a little bit about PAC Fleet's work with the Indian Fleet? Yeah, that's been one of the uh, one of the breakthroughs uh, uh, based on uh, great work with the Indian Navy and the Indian Navy's uh, attitude with the U.S. The Indian government's attitude uh, with us right now. Obviously, the change of the name to Indo-Pacific uh, uh, wasn't done without uh, without forethought. Uh, the Indians have stood up a uh, information fusing uh, uh, center in India that we are contributing uh, towards uh, their ability, and we talked about the unblinking eye, uh, their ability to, to look at the Straits of Malacca, uh, the northwestern end of the Straits of Malacca, and further west uh, across the, uh, the Indian Ocean. They bought P-8s. Uh, they have an incredible naval capability. Uh, they have a surveillance, uh, a good uh, ISR capability. So for us to be able to share information with us, uh, that partnership is critical uh, in, uh, in uh, I'm not going to say it's the beginning stages right now. We've moved off uh, beyond the beginning stages right now, and it's one we're, uh, one we're taking advantage of. It's a very important relationship. Well, thank you, sir. I think Admiral Mackey is coming up now to thank you on behalf of AFSIA Hawaii. Admiral Weissel, thank you very much. Tremendous coverage of the uh, Indo-Pacific, which we're all very interested in, and I thank you. I guarantee you this is not worth $25. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, sir. Thank you. Appreciate that, sir. But it is the biggest coin I've ever seen over the last year.
Thank you again, Admiral. At this time, would Linda Newton, Chairman of the Board of FCA Hawaii Education Foundation, Major General Dave Bryan, and Roshana McKee, former Space Cadre, to present the Leadership Forum certificates, please come up. Well, hi, everybody, and I tell you, we've had a tremendous uh, Leadership Forum again this year. Uh, I can't remember, Cynthia, how many years we've done this. Uh, Admiral Mackey, do you remember, sir, how many? Seven years, I think, uh, in a row. It just keeps getting better and better, and, and in just a minute, you'll see why we have a core group of graduates this year that are just, I tell you, not only uh, is the Leadership Forum about them, it's about everybody involved with it because we learn so much from everybody, and this year was no exception. I do want to recognize that once again, we had a terrific group of senior leader guest speakers as, that is part of the secret sauce, if you will, of why the Leadership Forum is so, so very uh, successful and has such a great impact. And I'd like to recognize them. I believe that four of them are here with us at the luncheon today, and if they would briefly stand and be recognized. First, uh, Ms. Amy Fadida. Amy, thank you. Uh, Jamie Holcomb. Jamie, thank you so much. Um, Jennifer Knapper is, I don't believe, here with us. Uh, no, but Jennifer was one of them. Uh, George Galderisi. George, where are you? I know you're here at lunch somewhere. George? Well, I saw him walk in the door. I guess he's not here right now. Okay, and uh, uh, Laurie Buckhold, uh, Buckhout. Laurie, where? Laura had to leave too. Well, I tell you, she was uh, she was here for lunch at least. I know that. <laughs> Somebody ate her lunch. I'm not sure who it was. Was that you, Randy? That yeah. So Randy Strong. Okay. So uh, I also want to recognize. Um, uh, it, for me, it's a personal honor and pleasure. I keep telling the chapter, if you keep inviting me, I'll keep coming from Virginia and doing this because it's a personal passion of mine. But it would not be possible if it were not for the support team that the Education Foundation and chapter provide to us. And I just want to recognize the two key people uh, in that effort this year, uh, Sean McKee and Dave Coger. It just wouldn't be possible without, without the two of them. Thank uh, every, all these special people. <laughs> this year, we had a great corporate sponsor uh, that uh, makes so much possible for us. It, it really gives us the freedom of action when we have a great corporate sponsor. And this year, it was Google Cloud. And I'd like to thank Scott Froman, who is the uh, head of the defense uh, side of Google Cloud. And, and Scott, if you'd like, if you'd like to come up and, and say something, come on up. Thank you, General O'Brien. Uh, I'll tell you, from uh, Google's perspective, it was actually an honor to sponsor this because not only do we believe that leadership is, is essential to the development of a large organization, certainly one that's as critical as our Department of Defense, but what I found in, in working with General O'Brien and seeing some of the, the content, there was a, to me, a surprising alignment between the principles of what these young leaders are learning and what we talk about at Google. Things like servant leadership, the difference and importance of, of leadership versus management. These are things that you know, we think, oh, Google's unique because we do all these things. You probably heard Google's a great place to work. We have this culture. These are the topics that was. Uh, and great shirts. And great shirts, yes, thank you. So uh, honor and a privilege, thank you. Thanks, Scott. Wouldn't be possible without you. Thank you. Scott, if you would step here, you and I are going to. We're going to now present to you uh, our graduates of this year's program and present them their uh, certificates. Yes. Becky DeFrank.
Lieutenant Rob Dilks. Tyrone Ellis. Israel Groves. He's Google too, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> Nico Jones. Emma Soyla Norbury. <laughs> Steve Page. Captain Scott Randall. And Paul Roquet. So, and as uh, I'm Linda Newton, the chairperson of the FCA Hawaii Educational Foundation, we do want to do a special recognition to Google Cloud for their sponsorship. They were involved throughout this whole week and was able to recognize the students, so we want to thank them. I'd like to now ask uh, Mr. Bob Shea and Corey Lindo to come up for the closing comments, please. Well, let me uh, start by thanking everybody for coming and for, uh, for being here for the week. This has been a, a very, very insightful week. It has really shown a bright light on the challenges that this theater uh, faces. And as you heard me say, uh, when we open up the conference, this, this theater has a very special place in my heart because I've got over 40% of my career out here. I think as you walk away and as, as you think about what has happened over the, the past week, I think you're certainly aware of the fact that we are in a very challenging environment right now. And it's up to and coming upon all of us, I think, to take the messages that we've heard throughout the week here, take them back and make sure that everybody is aware of what we're facing because, you know, that tyranny of distance, despite the internet and things like that, uh, sometimes the message doesn't quite resonate in the audiences that it needs to resonate. So I would invite you and ask you to carry what you heard back here, back, back to your homes, back to your states, um, and your local areas. I want to thank the, the local chapter out here. They do a great job every, every year out here. It's just a tremendous chapter out here. And we're, I want to thank the leadership of sitting over here, Jeff Bloom and his team, and Corey, and everyone else, because without their support, an event like this just couldn't happen. And the support and the things that go on behind the scenes uh, uh, would, would just kind of uh, blow your mind if you really understood what was going on. I'd like to thank the hotel staff, and I'd like to thank, the, again, all the volunteers that we got from the uh, chapter out here, almost 200 volunteers throughout the course of this week to put on in this event. And again, I'd like to thank uh, my team, the, the team from AFC International that came out there that has worked so closely with this chapter to put, it on, put on an event such as this. 
This is getting bigger and bigger. We've got about a 15% increase in the number of people that attended this year. Um, that's pretty significant. And I just see this getting bigger and bigger as that light gets brighter and brighter on this uh, combatant commander in this area of the world. Uh, it's better to address the challenges now and, and develop the strategy and the things that we need to do going forward than to wait when, until it's too late. And I think they are significant, but we can overcome them and it's incumbent upon all of us to do that. So again, from my perspective, I wanna thank everybody for the great work that they've done. I wanna thank the exhibitors and the sponsors, all the people that have done the great work. Dave Bryan for the work that you did with the Leadership Foundation. And again, thank you all very much. I'll turn it over to Corey. General Shea said it all, ditto, basically. We, we have great empathy for the staff of FC International. They do at least six to eight of these a year in various places. We work all year to do this. Cynthia has been our wonderful director for a number of years now. And although she looks calm, you should see her feet below the water, what actually happens. So with Terry helping her, as they do, and the 198 volunteers that we did have, our goal is always to attract one more person than we did last year. So, so far this year for two days, we've attracted 410 people more than we did last year. And we look forward to the revenue that comes in because it goes for scholarships for the Education Foundation, and it goes to help the community. Thank you very much, everybody, speakers, panelists, everyone. Thank you. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, United States Indo-Pacific Command, the component commands out here, the Navy, the Army, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard, the Air Force, and all of them, and for the speakers, and, and for sharing your insights to the challenges that you face. So everyone, I hope you have safe travels, and again, thank you for coming, and we'll look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you.